Buenos días, el encuentro del siglo. Please sit down. Take a chair. Les vamos a compartir las reglas del juego que definimos entre el señor Richard Dawkins, Tipa Chopra y su servidor. Un preámbulo. Bravo. De verdad es un honor tener estas mentes en este lugar. Recordarles a quienes tienen en este auditorio y qué pretendemos lograr con lo mismo. El doctor Richard Dawkins. Si pueden prender un poco las luces para que pueda ver tanto Richard como Deepa, que el auditorio que tienen. El señor Richard Dawkins escribió uno de los libros que han impactado más a la humanidad, el gen egoísta y de igual manera El espejismo de Dios, más muchísimos otros libros que han vendido más de dos millones de copias en inglés y está publicado en más de 30 idiomas. Este año, este año, el doctor Richard Dawkins, en el Prospect Magazine, salió como el pensador número uno del mundo. Es es galardonado además, fue galardonado con la medalla de plata de la Sociedad Zoológica de Londres y por supuesto es miembro exclusivo de la Real Sociedad de Londres, Fellow of the Royal Society. Entre muchas otras cosas, Richard Dawkins. De igual manera, de igual manera, Tipak Chopra es autor de más de 75 libros, incluyendo 21 New York Times Best Sellers. Es escritor, es médico y conferencista de origen indio y por supuesto proponente de medicina alternativa y Ayurveda fundando el Chopra Center for Wellbeing junto con David Simón. Señoras y señores, el señor Deepak Chopra, sus libros han sido traducidos también a más de 30 idiomas y ha vendido también más de 20 millones de copias en el mundo. Deepak Chopra. Para lograr este encuentro tuvimos muchas reuniones en Londres, telefónicas, desde San Diego y llegamos a los siguientes acuerdos desde hace más de ocho meses que empezó esto. Primero, esto no es un debate, this is not a debate, it's a dialogue, es un diálogo, es un encuentro. Queremos conocer a profundidad qué es lo que se opina y lo que se piensa sobre tres temas fundamentales. El primer tema es si realmente el universo tiene un propósito, si hay un para qué en la vida, si hay un sentido, o si por supuesto lo contrario es lo correcto, que no hay ningún propósito, la vida es la vida, la evolución es la evolución. Tema número dos, si la religión es buena o mala para la humanidad. Y tema número tres, la relación entre ciencia y espiritualidad. ¿Existe una física cuántica dentro de la espiritualidad y por lo tanto la espiritualidad es parte de la ciencia? ¿O eso es una charlatanería y la física cuántica ha sido abusada, mal interpretada y mal expuesta por la gente que cree en esta conciencia y en esta espiritualidad? Con base en estos tres temas, 
tanto Richard como Deepak, propusieron preguntas. Las preguntas de Deepak se encuentran aquí, las de Richard se encuentran aquí. Ellos podrán utilizar preguntas de aquí o de allá, o si quieren, hacer sus propias preguntas, porque sobre la evolución de este diálogo surgirán cosas que con antelación, por supuesto, no llegaron a suceder. Sin embargo, también tenemos unas pelotas transparentes que de vez en cuando vamos a sacar, que son preguntas realizadas por algunos de los speakers. A todos los speakers de las suelas ideas se les invitó a hacer preguntas. Algunos las enviaron. Reglas del juego. Deepak Chopra, después de definirlo con antelación, inicia y propone, al haber ganado el volado, que el señor profesor Dr. Richard Dawkins le haga la primera pregunta. Él tendrá tres minutos. Nosotros tenemos aquí un reloj. There is our watch. There are three minutes, Professor Dawkins. Three minutes. Once, una vez que empieza la pregunta, once he makes you the question, you just have three minutes to answer. Tienes tres minutos para contestar. Once you finished, you have 90 seconds, 90 seconds, to comment and talk about the answer that Deepak gave you. And then you will have 60 seconds, if you want, to have the last word of the question. And then vice versa. Is that clear? Is that, perfect? Is that okay, Professor Dawkins? It's okay? Perfect. Señoras y señores, este es un diálogo. Le quiero preguntar a ustedes que levante la mano quienes antes de empezar este encuentro consideran que el universo sí tiene un propósito, hay una fuerza sobrenatural que es parte de la ciencia. Quisiera saber que levante la mano. Prendan las luces, por favor. ¿Quiénes están a favor del señor Deepak Chopra con antelación y antes del encuentro? Griten yo. Ok. ¿Quiénes están de acuerdo con que la evolución, lo aleatorio, la selección natural y la vida no tiene un propósito más que la vida misma? Y que no hay una fuerza natural que levante la mano. Que griten yo. Wow. Es divided. ¿Quién cree que la religión es mala para la humanidad? Que grite yo. They believe that religion is bad for humanity. ¿Quiénes creen que la religión es good for humanity? O todos piensan igual y están muy confundidos o está muy, muy dividida la, la, el panel. Are you ready? Can we begin? Okay. So, Richard, we will begin with you. Would you like to use one of these balls? Or would you like to make your own questions? Or one of the questions that you wrote? Would you rather ask your own questions or one of the questions that you sent to me? Well, what about the white questions? Okay, we will begin. Él quiere al juego, al riesgo, al riesgo. Doki dice, yo quiero una pregunta de alguien que no conozca. La pregunta es nada más y nada menos. This question is from Alan de Botton. Wow. En español se las digo y ahora en inglés. ¿Alguna vez es suficiente? En inglés. Is it ever enough simply not to believe? What else can one believe in? ¿Alguna vez es suficiente simplemente no creer? ¿En qué más puede uno creer? Let me see the question. I didn't hear what. Is it ever enough simply not to believe? What else can one believe in? Please. Okay, so let me start out by saying that in my opinion, all belief is a cover up for insecurity. All belief. If I asked you, do you believe in electricity or gravity? You would find that a ridiculous question. 
So I'm not here to convince you that you should believe in anything, especially the supernatural. I'm here to ask you the most fundamental question that was posed earlier. Does the universe have a purpose? And there are two ways of looking at it. If you look at it from the top down, from the point of view of biological organisms, it looks like biological organisms are purpose-driven. Even, even a nematode or a small microorganism has some kind of sentience. It senses the environment, it processes it, it gets away from predators, it looks for food. So to me, biological organisms are purpose-driven. There's no question. In the human nervous system, that takes on questions like, do I have a soul? Does God exist? What is the meaning of life? Why is there a universe? Why is there awareness? Is there truth, goodness, beauty, harmony? Is evolution merely random mutations and natural selection? Or could there be other factors? Could it be guided by awareness and behavior? These questions occur to human beings. But I would say all organisms are purpose-driven. Now, when you look at this from the bottom up, from the point of view of individual particles coming out of the so-called quantum vacuum, there seems to be no purpose. It seems to be totally random for the individual particles that emerge from the infinite void, you might say, <clears throat> purposely, yeah, without purpose. But when you look at the sum, sum total of their activity, you have a universe. You have uh, constants that fine-tune the universe to be what it is. You have precise laws of nature which make sense to a rational human being. So I think even from the bottom up, I'm compelled to say that there's an organizing intelligence, there's a deeper consciousness that throws out this universe at the speed of light Sorry, from nothing. Dr. Chopra. Time is over. Thank you very much. Un aplauso, por favor. So now, there is no question but that. You have 90 seconds, please. There is no. 90 segundos en el reloj. There is no question, of course, but that individual organisms, nematode worms, birds, uh, can kangaroos, anything you like, behaves as if they have a purpose. Um, you described apparent sentience on the part of worms. They react to stimuli, they approach things. Individual organisms, animals, plants, bacteria, all behave as if they have a purpose. That's precisely the problem that Darwin solved. Why do living things look as though they've got a purpose? Darwin showed, that, that, um, showed the answer to that problem was evolution by natural selection. But that's a very, very different matter from saying that the universe has a purpose. This is a complete confusion of scale. Individual organisms have a purpose for reasons we understand very well, Darwinian reasons, but that is a hundred miles, a million miles from saying that something like the universe has a purpose. Purpose came into the universe late. It came into the universe late after the Darwinian process had got going, had produced nervous systems, had produced brains. Brains are things that have purposes. Brains have purposes. Brains, in the case of human brains, make machines which also have purposes. But that's the correct understanding of purpose. To push purpose back to the universe itself is to make a complete confusion. We have Deepak, 60 seconds. I think the confusion is because Dr. Dawkins looks at biological organisms as separate from the universe and not as activities of the universe. You and I right now are an activity of the universe. And as an activity of the universe, we are expressing purpose. But Dr. Dawkins did not address 
why the universe is fine-tuned to so that we can have this conversation why are the laws so rational what is the origin of these laws to bypass that we would have to propose 10 to the power of 500 universes that randomly ar arise from nothing not only is the universe arising from nothing but this nothing seems to be the womb of creation where nature goes to the same place to create a galaxy of stars or an electrochemical impulse in your own neural networks. Thank you very much. We have two options. One is now we take another ball and now you make him a question or we give each of you one more minute to keep talking in depth about this important okay, concern. Sorry. Would you rather that? Yeah. Por favor, pongan otra vez. You will have three minutes and you three minutes. Okay, por favor. Tres minutos, please. The issue of the fine-tuning of the universe, of course, is a completely different one, and it's a very interesting one which we can talk about. However, that was not what you were originally talking about. You were originally talking about the apparent purposefulness of living organisms, which is striking. I mean, it's a very, very important aspect of living things. That's why we needed Darwin to explain it. Darwin did explain it. Darwin explained how starting with no purpose at all, nothing that you could call purpose, uh, the laws of physics working through this remarkable process called evolution by natural selection gave rise to cells, to nervous, nerve cells, to nervous systems, to brains, to the illusion of purpose. Well, indeed, the very genuine purpose, because in living things, purpose is a very genuine phenomenon. We understand how it happened. It happened because of evolution. Now, to go back to the universe is another matter entirely. And now you've changed the subject and talked about the alleged fine-tuning of the universe, which is a very important and interesting question, one that is in the province of physics. You and I are both biologists, not physicists, but we can have a go at talking about it. Some physicists have alleged that the fundamental constants of the universe are very fine-tuned such that if any of them were any different, the universe would not come into being the way that it is, and we wouldn't have stars, we wouldn't have galaxies, we wouldn't have chemistry, we wouldn't have life, and we wouldn't have us. Some physicists dispute the alleged fine-tuning. Other physicists say that we don't yet understand enough about physics in order to know where those fundamental constants come from, yet other physicists still talk about a multiverse in which there's a very large number of universes, and most of those universes do not have the, uh, co the physical constants tuned in order to give rise to, to us, but a tiny minority do, and by the anthropic principle, we clearly have to be in one of those universes that does have those properties. Uh, Three minutes is an absurdly short time in which to talk about this, uh, and it wasn't the original question, but perhaps we can come back to it on a, 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 with a, a, a later discussion. Muchas gracias. <sighs> Dr. Chopra, there? he just wants to use two minutes. You have three minutes like he had it, okay. whatever you want. But so, Dr. Dawkins, uh, you and I are both have biological backgrounds and we have both dabbled a little bit in quantum physics. I have to say that uh, my current book is uh, co-authored by a professor, a chaired professor in genetics and, uh, and neuroscience at Harvard. I am writing and have, ex have ex papers accepted in professional journals on quantum biology and neuroscience, and I can give you the citations later, but there's a school of scientists who believe that if you look across the universe, it shows the following properties. Sentience at all levels. By sentience, I mean the ability to sense information, process it, and come up with an intelligent response. Complementarity at all levels, which means that the universe is empirical, but most of it is actually non-empirical, non-observable. It is wave-like, when you don't know where these waves are, they'd have no units of mass and energy, and it is particle-like, which have units of mass and energy. So it gets weird at this level. 
but it also seems to be self-organizing, it self seems to be self-regulating, it seems to be self-evolving, it's an evolution, of course, I'm not arguing with you that Darwin is right or wrong. I, I think Darwin made the most major contribution that we can have to our understanding of the evolution of species. But that's not the question. The question is, does evolution itself have a purpose? And I think, yes, evolution has a purpose. It's evolution itself. Evolution is guided by awareness, by consciousness, and the purpose of evolution is maximum diversity, maximum diversity, because that's what we see in the universe. And what we experience as perceptual phenomena are not fundamental reality at all, because every species has its own perceptual experience of the universe. These scientists that I work with say that awareness is a singularity, perceptual experiences are many, and the evolution of species is actually the evolution of consciousness to express itself as multiple observers, multiple modes of observation, and multiple objects of observation. We are the eyes of the universe looking at itself. This brain is, a, is, an, is the observation deck for the universe to experience itself. That's the purpose. The, the scientists that I respect are scientists who work hard to be understood, to use language clearly, to use words correctly, and to understand what is going on. We have been subjected to a kind of word salad of scientific jargon used out of context with in inappropriately, apparently uncomprehendingly. Um, there is a deep confusion going on here between the properties of things within the universe and the properties of the universe itself. It is one thing to say that the universe contains objects that have sentience and the various other properties that you mentioned. Of course it contains objects that, that have sentience. We are among those objects. So are dogs, so are chimpanzees. The universe contains sentience. The universe is not sentient. This is the one thing, Deepak, you seem not to understand. You're constantly confusing explanations at the level of what goes on inside the universe with the universe itself. It's not enough to say the universe contains sentience, contains purpose, etc., and say, therefore, the universe is sentient, the universe is purposeful. Evolution, you say, has a purpose, diversity, because what we see is diversity. Of course what we see is diversity. That's the consequence of evolution. But you mistake when you think Time. that evolution is Time. driven towards it. Time is over. How Un much time do I have when? to respond? How sure. much time? So, One thirty minutes and we, How much? please. Uno treinta. It's your turn. So, Dr. Dawkins, I would like to remind you that ad hominem is a logical fallacy, and that's science 101. You should know that. Ad hominem means talking I, about this person is my as an turn individual. to speak, sir. Okay? You accuse me of jargon. You accuse me of misusing language. How many people understood what I was saying? You're lying. <laughs> okay? Now. I just, I just came back from a conference on science and non-duality where there were over 300 scientists, biologists, neuroscientists, etc., who totally get this language. So just because it sounds like jargon to you doesn't mean it's jargon. You know, when a doctor speaks to a patient, the patient thinks the doctor is speaking jargon. When a mathematician speaks to people who are not mathematicians, this is an evolving science, sir. We do not know the answers to the two most fundamental questions of existence. Number one, what is the stuff of the universe? We don't know. 96% is dark 
energy and dark matter. Of the 4% that's atomic, 99% of that is invisible hydrogen and helium. Time and over. we don't know why there is awareness. The Time two over. most fundamental questions of our existence. Please, please. Of course, no 30, por we don't know about dark matter, dark energy. That's why we need more science and better science in order to, to solve that. You've changed the subject yet again. Let's talk about sentience. You say the universe has sentience. The universe doesn't have sentience. Things in the universe have sentience. Why do you say, why do you confuse this audience by saying the universe has sentience? Can you tell me what the composition of the universe is? That wasn't the question. No, because you're talking things, right? Things are basically the atomic universe is stardust, and stardust has sentience in you and me. It's according to people like Freeman Dyson, even atoms have sentience. Atoms have no sentience. Atoms you disagree with Freeman Dyson? Yeah, then? If, if that's what he says, which I doubt, I disagree with him. <laughs> Atoms do not have sentience. Atoms contribute to making brains. Brains have sentience. You need a highly complicated organization. It's a fundamental error to say that because a complicated thing has a quality like sentience, musicality, mathematical ability, and is made of atoms, therefore the atoms have sentience musical ability, mathematical ability, etc. They do not. Atoms have to be arranged in complicated organizations, complicated structures interacting with each other, and then you will get emergent properties, emergent properties such as sentience, such as poetry, such as mathematical ability, such as spirituality. They, these things do not inhere in the atoms themselves, or if they do, you've got a hard job to prove it. You have, you have a hard job to prove it? Can okay. you prove it? I'm sure you're aware of the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that we have no science that tells us why we have any experience, whether it's mental, subjective, or it's an experience of the objective world, how photons coming and hitting our retina create the experience of a three-dimensional reality in space and time. This is the hard problem. It's the most fundamental problem in science. First, what is the stuff of the universe? And second, why is there awareness of the universe? Is awareness of the universe and the universe the same thing? Because if there was a universe outside of your awareness for all practical purposes, you would never know it. So to say that sentience is an emergent property is assuming that only brains produce consciousness, whereas in fact, even a single fertilized cell, when you were conceived, was fully alive, was fully aware, and did not have a brain. It was present, it was aware, and it differentiated into trillions of cells, more than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, to create who you are. So to say that sentience requires an emergence through evolution, instead of saying that Actually, evolution could be driven by consciousness. These are the questions that some people are asking. And if you propose that sentience is an emergent property, then answer to me why there is no science that can actually give us an explanation to the most, two most fundamental questions of our existence. What is the nature of the universe? What's it made up of? And why is there sentience? Why is there sentience? You know, we talk about sentience as not just human sentience, which is, of course, you know, an evolutionary process, but sentience came from sentience. Have you, you seen evolution? Aristotle? Evolution does not explain the origin of life. It only explains the transformation of species. Yes, you change the subject Second, again. You will have one minute and one well, minute, and we will finish with this topic of the universe. And have we you seriously just said that a single cell has consciousness? A single cell has awareness. What do you mean by that? That it has the ability to respond to its environment. Of course it has the ability to respond to its environment. That is so, not consciousness. You, uh, so you said a while ago, atoms get together to create complexity. How do they get together? 
by processes which are well understood by, by a biologists. process which is random <laughs> or intelligent not intelligence okay by the processes of embryology put together by the processes of evolution you cannot seriously sit there and say that the hard problem of consciousness and it is a very hard problem is solved by saying that a single cell has consciousness a single cell has sentience in the fact that it can respond to its environment and express its biological autonomy. But okay, just, just one what second, please. Un segundo, por favor. I think we're in a little loop because we cannot prove either I, things. You know, I, I want to nail I, this. I want to nail this. Very, this. This gets to the root of the problem. It does. Consciousness is something very, very complicated. Of course, we don't understand it. That's why it's called the hard problem. It's something that happens when brains reach a certain level of complexity. Now, a single cell, a single neuron, a single amoeba, a single cell, a thermostat even, has sentience in your sense. But has, that is nothing to do with... Has the ability to take in information, process information, and respond with autonomy. That is sentience. That's trivial. That's utterly trivial. You're confusing but, perception with awareness. Perception is, very, is not fundamental reality. If there was an insect with a hundred eyes looking at me, it wouldn't experience the same me as you are. So perception is a species-specific and culture-specific experience in consciousness. It has nothing to do with fundamental reality, the awareness that differentiates into what we call, in us anyway, cognition, perception, uh, imagination, insight, intuition, creativity, choice, freedom, the desire for meaning, purpose, all of that are expressions of awareness as consciousness and influence everything that we experience in life. You think a single cell has that? Hmm? And, and you think a, a single, single cell, cell has, that? has a rudimentary form of awareness? Do you think and an atom has that? Sorry? Do you think an atom has that? According to Freeman Dyson, yes. Freeman Dyson says an atom has awareness. Yes, sir. Check it out. Check Señoras y señores, un aplauso para los dos. Check ¡Qué extraordinario! Also, also Keep back. One second, please. At, at the end, the problem is that you, or you, we cannot prove it very well, and we'll talk about it in that, but just one second. Changing a little bit about the topic, the second box of our, of our dialogue has to do with science. I have been very surprised that you, for example, you mentioned, well, both of us, we share the same background in biology, in medicine, in science. The question is, how come that you share the same scientific background and you differ so much? My question is, are there two types of science? Or he went to a school that it was not really a very good school, or you went to the wrong school, or what's going on here? Or, or there is a physics quantic for you and for... Please explain me, how would could you, you share like this go, background? Would you like to go first or you yes. want me to go first? Tres minutos, por favor. My attitude to science is that we are fundamentally trying to understand how things work. Science is very difficult. It's very difficult to understand how things work. The hard problem of consciousness has been mentioned, the problem of the origin of the universe, the problem of the origin of life, the problem of how life has this uncanny appearance of, of being designed, the size of the universe, the scale of the universe, uh, how embryology works. These are all deeply difficult questions. They require hard scientific work. And in all cases, I think I'm right in saying that scientific work consists of explaining complicated things in terms of the interactions of their parts or of simpler things. So we always try to explain complex things in terms of simpler things. We do not resort to magical language. We do not snow our audience with highfalutin sounding words that don't actually mean anything. We use words that actually have meaning. We use uh, expressions that can be tested. We work hard at understanding the universe 
in terms of its component parts. We don't invent superarching entities which have no explanation in themselves. We don't invoke ideas like the universe has consciousness, the universe has awareness, atoms have awareness. If we have a difficult problem like awareness, we explain it in terms of the interactions between small parts working together in ways that scientists understand. If Freeman Dyson ever said atoms are aware, then he's wrong. I don't think he said it. I think he should sue you. Wow. Three minutes. Three minutes. Ad hominem is a logical fallacy, science 101. I'm not going to resort to the tactics that you use, sir. Friedman Dyson said it, and so did Schrodinger say that consciousness is in the universe. Max Planck said that mind is the matrix of matter. I could go on and on about the pioneers of the early physics, the quantum physics, who were compelled to include consciousness as a fundamental aspect of reality. Consciousness is the white elephant in the room. You require consciousness to come up with a theory. You require consciousness to design an experiment. You require consciousness to make an observation. Science is the offspring of consciousness. It is the product of consciousness. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say here is very clearly that uh, there's no argument about the fact that evolutionary biology explains everything about the species going from one species to another. But if you want to understand science in its totality, you have to bring consciousness into the equation, because as we currently practice science, it's based on what we call a subject-object split. Split. There's an observer involved in every observation. Science doesn't ask who the observer is, who's the observing self, where is the observing self. But in the absence of the observing self, there wouldn't be any observation and there wouldn't be any science. The observing self cannot be glimpsed by science and scientific methodology because it happens to be the observer. The observer cannot be observed. And that's where spirituality comes in if you define spirituality as self-awareness. Only consciousness can know consciousness. Only consciousness can explain consciousness. Only consciousness can understand consciousness. Any scientific understanding of consciousness through looking at the brain is at best inferential. You're looking at correlations of experiences conscious in consciousness through objective means. So I think science is incomplete as a way of understanding fundamental reality. It's based on a fragmented view of reality. Subject, object, split. Nature is one. The, the, the universe includes observers, modes of observation, and objects that are observed. So science, because it's fragmented, like religion, which has been fragmented, is capable of creating diabolical technologies. Everything that is wrong today in the world, everything that is wrong in, today in the world, from global warming to biological warfare to mechanized death to eco-destruction to the extinction of species, is because science has evolved without time, the evolution of over. spirituality. Thank you. Science Spirituality, okay. science now, complete. Now, okay, well, I will have a few questions not, from, please. I shall, not make, I shall not make an argument ad hominem. My argument is ad bullshitem. Okay, you're violating all the rules of logic. Of course we need to understand consciousness. Of course consciousness is vital to everything we do. Consciousness is something we are all aware of, is something profoundly difficult to understand. It's something that science desperately needs to understand. That we can surely agree upon. That does not mean the universe is conscious. That does not mean any of the things you've just said. It means that consciousness is a subject which is worthy of scientific exploration. 
proper scientific exploration, which means understanding consciousness in terms of nervous systems, possibly in the future in terms of computers, because it's conceivable that computing machines may reach the stage of complexity and organization that they too will experience subjective consciousness. But whatever experiences subjective consciousness is going to be complicated, is going to be a very large organization of lots of small parts interacting together in very complex ways. An atom will never be conscious, nor will a single cell. Sir, so may I ask you a question? Have you ever engaged in self-reflection or self-awareness? Have you ever experienced transcendence? Have you ever questioned if perceptual reality is different from fundamental reality? Have you ever questioned the idea that science does not examine reality but creates models of reality? Have you ever thought, if computers will explain, explain consciousness, have you ever thought who will design those computers and where will those computers be conceived and constructed? If you have never experienced a fundamental, unique experience that has existed throughout history, through antiquity, it's called transcendence. It's experiencing the self. And it's the knowingness that the self of the individual is the self of the universe. I'm not talking this, creating this language by myself. This is the perennial philosophy that Aldous Huxley spoke about. It's what Gottfried Leibniz spoke about. The sages of the Upanishads spoke about. The transcendentalists like Emerson and Thoreau spoke about. But if you have never had the experience of what people call non-symbolic awareness, okay, we have your question. you have no what right about to comment on science being a complete way back. to understand reality. Okay, the question is there. I have, experienced, I have experienced plenty of things which could be called transcendental. I've experienced the feeling of almost mystical wonder that I get when I look up at the stars, look up at the Milky Way, uh, contemplate the galaxies receding from us, listen to a Schubert quintet, uh, read a sonnet of Shakespeare. These are all things which only a human mind is capable of doing. So may I ask you? Let, 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 let. Okay, sorry. Only a human mind is capable of doing that. And a human mind is capable of doing those things because the human mind has been put together in the brain put. as a highly complicated organization that has evolved over some four billion years of evolution, putting together nervous systems. It is a stunning achievement of evolution to have put together the human brain, the human brain that is capable of being moved by such things. I yield to no one in my capacity to be moved by what you call the, the transcendental. What I do not do, however, is to indulge in mystical nonsense about it being there before there were brains or the equivalent of brains. Wow. Okay. Now, one second. I want to ask him you one have the question. Okay. You, so no, I, I'm going to. Okay. I understand that you've had those wonderful experiences. Have you had the experience of gratitude? Have you experienced epistemological humility? Have you experienced reverence for life and for existence? And if so, and if so, was it your neural networks manufacturing those experiences, neurochemicals manufacturing their experiences, yeah. or was there a deeper, intelligent, organizing consciousness that was influencing the behavior of those neural networks? How much deeper do you want? How much deeper do Answer you want? Answer me, sir. Have you experienced reverence? You have asked me, have I experienced gratitude? I experience gratitude, gratitude to nothing in particular, but I feel gratitude. I feel all those things that, that you say. And I do not yield to you in my feeling of the depth of which it is, the depth of understanding that we have yet to fathom, yet to plumb, in order to understand what's going on inside the human brain. Who's we? Who's my we? Mind. Who's we? The let scientific let community. The scientific community. Yes driven by mechanistic neural networks and chemicals? 
Yes, and don't let's belittle mechanistic neural networks and chemicals. They well, are very, very Well, then tell me how they produce consciousness. I don't know. That's why we're working on it. <laughs> you don't know either. No, wait. You, you say you don't know, but you totally dismiss mystical experiences or experiences that have existed for thousands of years, subjective, but nevertheless symbolically present in every tradition of the world where people have experienced what I would call non-symbolic awareness, non-dual awareness, subject-object confluence, unity consciousness. You totally dismiss this because it doesn't fit your scientific worldview. I don't dismiss it for one moment. I don't dismiss it. I want to explain it. I Who want wants to explain it? it? Just, just, let him, just let him finish. I want to explain these experiences. Who's I? I want science to explain it. When you say I, who do you mean by I? Science, in this case. So I is science. No. That's just a, that's just a dishonest, that's dishonest. It's... Please. I, as, as a scientist, want the scientific community to understand these wonderful experiences that mystics throughout the ages have experienced, and I believe that I've experienced something similar, I believe that you have experienced something similar. They need explaining, and they will be explained, if ever, in terms of brains. That's a promissory note. It is. In this economy, don't trust a promissory note. It is a promissory note. And then the, nothing to be ashamed of. So you have of. extreme, extreme confidence in the way we do science. You're not open to a consciousness-driven science, a consciousness-based science. I don't know what that would even mean. An observer-based science. Observer-based science is another matter, of course. Ob oh. Science is necessarily observer-based. Well, observer we is to, consciousness. We need to. Isn't the observer? You don't have a monopoly of consciousness. We all have consciousness. Okay. We're trying to explain. Un aplauso it. para los dos. Wow. Vamos a ir otro tema. We're going to another topic. We have talked a lot about consciousness. Probably have. Now, now I would like to ask you, Deepak, and then Richard. We have been talking a lot about in Mexico and many places that if there, if, if we assume that there is this consciousness. We can work with this energy. And we have written a lot of books about it. And that you could actually attract things or make things happen. And there is a purpose, but there is also an intention. So my question to you, and then I will make a question to Dr. Tawkins, is if you can really make this change and this, and this energy to have a direction, how come you cannot change his direction, and you cannot change the direction of a lot of people from here. What, what is the problem with this energy that you are not attracting to make things happen the way you understand the world, because there is a way to do it? We are all conditioned by the hypnosis of our childhood and conditioned by society, by ideologies, by religion, by history, by economics, and the prevailing scientific paradigm to look at the world in a certain way. And, you know, you asked the question, intention. I would ask, what's the origin of intention? Okay. Do you believe in free will, sir? I think free will is a very persuasive illusion. I'm very pleased to have that illusion. I behave and feel as if well, I have free will. Well, then we might as well stop the debate. None of us has free will or the ability to make a choice right now. Uh, I do believe that your intentions trigger behavior, trigger neural networks to act in a certain way, activate genes that uh, are activated as a result of your emotional experiences. So I believe that intention triggers neural networks and then reinforces them, if you reinforce the intention, what we call habit, to create what is called long-term potentiation, and that then your behavior influences the activity of your genes to reinforce that behavior. So the fact is 
that uh, you won't change anybody's mind here after the debate. In fact, those people who agree with Dr. Dawkins will go back stronger in their belief. Okay, and those people yeah, who agree with me will go back stronger. We we're not going to change your minds because we're all bamboozled by our conditioning to begin with. Well, that can we prove it. Hmm? That can we prove it. We will see. Dr. Dawkins, how could you explain that so many people follow his ideas? I know that it's very frustrated for you. I, I can feel it. The way that we're brain works and how difficult pressure, it is. Richard. The question that I make you, how do you explain the brain of most of the people, not, to, not everybody, probably not even most, but how many millions of people follow and believe what you think it's really bullshit? I don't know. I mean, I, um, <laughs> I, 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 Un aplauso um, para los dos, gran evento, señoras way, y señores. ¿Cómo vamos de tiempo? By the way, we have, we have five minutes. So please, I, I, I would love to have more time, but we have another debate. Okay, we will have 10 minutes. So, okay, we will have the whole year here. No, yes. Okay. By the way, please. Bullshit recycles as life. <laughs> I, I, I didn't hear that. What is it? Bullshit recycles as life. Okay. In India, we call in, it in, in that, cow shit. That's where we call the cows. Vamos bully. a tener 10 minutos. Tenemos otro debate. Les quiero preguntar, por favor. Vamos a probar la hipótesis, que es además de un biólogo, que acaba de decir Deepak. Who will prove his hypothesis? Who have changed? ¿Quién ha cambiado? Pero sean honestos. No por darle lugar a uno o al otro. ¿Quién antes del debate pensaba como Deepak o como Richard? Pero después de esto. Cambió de opinión. Griten, yo cambié, yo. Well, there are few people. Okay. You have, we have to, to, you have to ask him just one question, just one question, and we will talk five minutes in each of those topics, and the debate will be over, okay? So he asked a question. It's your turn, please. Or would you, or would you rather that we have another, you have well, a question from have, your own, I may please. Have something. Still learning my way around this. Okay, th this, th this is a quote from Deepak. Um, it's an interesting one. Evolution doesn't simply, this is from your book with Mlodinow. Evolution doesn't simply scramble old ingredients into new forms, nor does it just turn small clumps of matter into bigger clumps. Instead, evolution makes lumps of creativity. These happen in quantum form. That is, there is a sudden emergence of a property that never existed before. Quantum, there's a little gap there then. Quantum leaps dominate in creation everywhere we look, but especially in the startling, beautiful novelty of life forms on Earth. The cosmos is ruled by creativity. Now, neither of us are physicists, so we neither of us actually know much about quantum theory, but we are biologists. And you have used the word, the jargon of quantum theory there to apply to evolution as though evolution, in, it takes quantum leaps or what do you mean by that? The, the emergence of language, for example, from no language at all is a quantum leap. Okay, the emergence of, um, of, um, of organisms the transition of organisms where you do not actually see continuity is a quantum leap. Quantum leaps are happening in consciousness and biology all the time. Right now I'm wearing biosensors, by the way, and these are measuring things like blood pressure, uh, skin resistance, all kinds of things. This information can be transmitted to an iPhone and goes to a computer and scripts where we are doing digital monitoring of consciousness, how it affects biology. Wait a minute. So if I said, so I know his blood pressure is rising right now just by me saying these things. So this is right there, proof of the mind-body connection. You, can, I can, you know, if somebody says, I love you, and it means something to you, your brain makes dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, opiates. If the same person says, 
another person says, I love you, or the same person, and you're thinking of divorcing them, then you don't make dopamine, you make adrenaline and cortisol, and it happens instantly. There's a quantum shift in your biology just in the way you processed meaning. And there's no physical mechanism that explains how we process meaning in our lives. Only consciousness can process meaning. So when you say quantum leaps in evolution, one of the big problems in evolution right now, you will admit, is the missing gaps in the fossil record. Now, if, when I say that, evolutionary biologists will either snigger or raise their blood pressure, which he's doing right now. So, you know, because they're so sure that evolution has only those two mechanisms, natural selection and random evolution. The current issue, the current issue of the new scientist has a feature article called Do Organisms Guide Their Own Evolution? And it talks about how phenotypes might drive the genetic expression, how use-dependent activation of genes uh, will reinforce even uh, the propagation of those genes through natural selection. The reporter who wrote the article, he called Dr. Dawkins, by the way, who was extremely di dismissive of him. Do you remem remember okay. him calling Ta you? Time is over. Otros tres minutos. You have three minutes, Dr. Dawkins. This really epitomizes the problem we're up against. You have used the word quantum leap in two totally different ways, and you've confused everybody, not everybody, I'm happy to say. Um, a quantum you, leap. You have, used the, you have used the phrase quantum leap to apply to the origin of language the, and the origin of life and jumps in the fossil record. Now, this is a purely metaphorical usage of the term quantum leap, all you're using it for is a change that's occurred in the world for which we have as yet no explanation. A change? That's, a change? May I finish, please? Finish. On the other hand, you have used the word quantum uh, in the proper physicist sense. You talked about um, digital information going to satellites and things like that. In that case, you were talking about quantum theory in the true sense of quantum mechanics. You are bamboozling people by using quantum in two completely different senses, giving them the impression that there's something about modern physics, something about the spooky aspects of modern physics, which is relevant to things like the origin of language or the origin of life or breaks in the fossil record. Now, those three things, the origin of life, origin of language, breaks in the fossil record, are scientific problems to the extent that we don't yet have the answer to them, we're still working on them. They have nothing whatsoever to do so with quantum in the physicist sense. He has one thirty minutes. You still, you still have one thirty seconds. Yes, okay, it's your turn. Tres minutos, por favor. There are several uses of the word quantum that are not restricted to a subatomic particle moving from lung, one location to another location without going through the space between. That's what a leap is, a quantum leap in quantum physics. But the broader community uses quantum for any phenomenon, any space-time event that exists in one location in space or time and then exists in another location of space and time without going through the intervening space. It's called the discontinuity. And the use I have given it is a very broad use. Of course, Dr. Dawkins rightly claims that it is a metaphorical use, but he should understand that all science is metaphor anyway to begin with. Nobody's actually, you know, uh, explained how a subatomic particle appears out of a non empirical realm. And then when it's not being observed or it's not interacting with other particles, how does it go back? So, yes, quantum leap has a much broader connotation, including if you watch Star Trek, when the captain says, beam me up, Scotty, and Scotty presses a button, and the captain disappears here and shows up there without going through the space in between. So I agree I've used it metaphorically, but in fact, all science is a metaphor.
Metaphors, Un minuto y medio, por favor. Met met metaphors are extremely valuable. I use them myself all the time, but a good metaphor is one that clarifies and doesn't obscure. For you, uh, sir, it, let, let, it let confuses finish. you. Please, it's not Deepak. confusing a lot of people out there. Deep, please. Perhaps you, you should you catch talked, up. You talked, you talked about uh, the analogy being, in this case, going from one place to another without passing through the intermediates. That's a hell of a leap for you to make. When you talk about the origin of life, there is no such thing as, as, as not passing through the intermediate stages. There were intermediate stages. We just don't know what they were at present. That's a very different thing. In the case of gaps in the fossil record, uh, the gaps in the fossil record apply quite simply because not everything fossilizes. It's rather a good thing it doesn't, otherwise we'd, have, we'd be snowed under with, with fossils. The origin of language, a mysterious and fascinating question. We don't know what the intermediate stages were, but we're absolutely sure there were intermediate stages. There were intermediate stages in all three cases. Now, it is true that in everyday language, in the English language, we do use the phrase quantum leap to mean something rather vague. But we don't bamboozle audiences by deliberately confusing that with a modern physics explanation which everybody, including you and me, finds hard to understand. Incidentally, because I was coming here and because I've been, I've been heavily criticized by some the mainstream scientific community for my book, Quantum Healing, including by Dr. Dawkins, I just, out of curiosity this morning, went to Google to look at the reviews of quantum healing when it first appeared in 1988. And there's a really good review, guys, in the New England Journal of Medicine of that book, okay? So, uh, again, Dr. F uh, Dawkins would like to check it out, just like he wants to check out Freeman Dyson, because it doesn't appear with his worldview. I have just had a paper accepted in a journal called Quant uh, Neuroquantology with two quantum physicists, including a, a chaired professor in a university in California. It's going to appear in December 25. I have written papers on quantum consciousness in the Journal of Cosmology, a special edition that was edited by Sir Roger Penrose. So, you know, I am not that loose with my language. I know when I use metaphor, and I know when I use it Deepak, accurately as well. thank you very much. Richard, thank you very much. Let me just share very few things with you. We have been, actually, we have, we are almost running out of time. time it's pretty interesting exist. that in the, in the side of science, we still have a lot of questions. And we know that we have to have a curious mind, think about it, but we don't, we don't have all the answers. And that's, that's, this is the scientific mind. In the other hand, as we can see with the spirituality, Probably in this, in this side of the, of, of, of the spectrum, he or somebody or, or many people have found or discovered many answers that scientists are still looking for. And probably the reference that Deepak put to support his work are the same that will support him or vice versa. And at the end will be a loop. And we have been talking around all this time into two big questions the purpose of the universe, the awareness of the consciousness, the methodology, the methodology that science uses, the methodology that spiritual people uses, and also we have talked about two kinds of sciences in a way. We share the same background, but we differ in all the results and the outcomes. The only question that we didn't answer, and we just have two minutes or three, but I think it's also a very important topic for this for this day, it has to do with religion. And this will be the last opportunity to say something because it was part of the agreement. The big question was, is religion good or bad for humanity? And I know it's a very big question for three minutes to answer. But I don't want to leave this auditorium without having the chance to listen to your opinion. So we will begin with you. Three minutes. Is religion good or bad? It's neither and it's both. Religion, like any institution, has succumbed to cronyism, power mongering, influence peddling, corruption, bureaucracy, and all the things that happen with 
organizing any activity. Is it good? Well, people have had religious experiences throughout the ages, which include transcendence, epistemological humility, reverence, gratitude, uh, the feeling and emergence of platonic qualities like truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, understanding that there is evolution in the universe. These are, I think, religious experiences, and they have been there throughout history. There is also, through religious experience, a shift in identity from personal identity to a broader identity that allows those people who have that experience to overcome their fear of death, to lose their fear of death. And there is, again, what I said, this deep humility and gratitude and reverence for the mystery of our existence. That's the religious experience. Now, of course, it can be corrupted, and people go to war and kill each other and do all kinds of abysmal things in the name of God and the name of religion. But that doesn't mean that the religious experience itself is invalid. Uh, does science have good or bad aspects to it? A fragmented science in the absence of evolutionary uh, changes in our spirit or consciousness creates the technologies I mentioned. You know, mechanized death, uh, global warming, climate change, extinction of species, extinction, uh, risking our own extinction. So I believe that we do need a broader science that accommodates spirituality, the spiritual experience, so we use what we know from science wisely so that we can make the best use of scientific technologies. But I do say that science will never give us the answer into the meaning of our existence, into why there's a universe, why there is consciousness. Only consciousness can experience consciousness. That's why we need spirituality. If by spirituality, I mean self-awareness, self-reflection, transcendence, and our own desire to know ourselves. In my view, our search for God is our highest instinct to know ourselves, to find meaning in our own lives, to understand why there is evolution, what is the purpose of existence. Thank you very much. Time is over. The question is not whether individual people who happen to be religious or who happen not to be religious are good or bad. Uh, the question is whether religion itself is. I think there are aspects of religion which are bad in, in themselves. I think that the idea of blind faith, believing something without evidence, and sheltering behind the right to hold faith, uh, such that you can justify doing bad things because your religion, your faith tells you it's the right thing to do. Many, many good and righteous people who believe themselves to be good and righteous have done terrible things precisely because they believe that they're doing it for their God. So faith, blind faith, can have that bad effect. Uh, for myself as a scientist, I'm accustomed to saying that the thing that I really object to about religion is that it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding, teaches us to be satisfied with pseudo-explanations which are really not explanations at all, things that sound good. <laughs> things that sound like an explanation but which really aren't, which appeal to the emotions but don't actually explain anything. So I think that religion in that sense can be the enemy of science, the enemy of truth. But this evening I'm reflecting more that what may really be the enemy of truth and the enemy of science is willful obscurantism, whether it comes from religion or not. Wow. Can I say something? Sure. But that is the I just want to thank uh, Andres Romer and Dangerous Ideas for bringing together this meeting, which would have never happened were it not for his effort. This is a once-in-a-lifetime meeting because I'm sure that Dr. Dawkins and I have no intention of meeting again. Wow! Por favor!
¡Levántense todos! ¡Un stand ovation! Señoras y señores, el encuentro del siglo. Fotografía. Fotografía, dense la mano. Es un honor. Thank you very much. It was an honor, a delight, to think about thinking with you. Pensar sobre pensar con Richard Dawkins, Deepak Chopra. Gracias.